Hello, my name is Dr. Teresa Bacon Bagley. I'm a professor in the College of Health Professions at Grand Valley State University. Today, we're gonna to look at eight ways that science examines the brain in traumatic brain injury. Some of these ways are done routinely in patients that have traumatic brain injury, while other ways are used strictly as a research mode to examine the brain to determine differences in states of disease or injury. The goals of this module are to be able to describe the following ways that science can investigate the brain, such as x-rays. We'll also look at computerized tomography, or in other words, CT scan. We'll also look a little bit at magnetic resonance imaging, or an MRI. We'll also look at functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. We'll also describe what positron emission tomography is, or PET scanning. We'll look at electroencephalogram, or the EEG, magnetoencephalography, which is the MEG, and we'll also look at how behavioral studies help scientists discover things about the brain. Now, the first way to look at the brain that we're going to discuss is the x-rays. Now, x-rays use electromagnetic energy beams to produce images of internal tissues, bones, and organs. The soft tissue allow most of the x-rays to pass through, while the bone or a very dense tumor allows few x-rays to pass through. And because of those differences, an image can be obtained that can look at those very dense structures. So therefore, bony structures will show up well on an x-ray, whereas normal brain tissue does not, because it's kind of a very soft tissue. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the bony skull, you can see the bony vertebra, you can see the bony jawbone, etc but you don't see the parts of the brain. Now the x-ray of the head can give you a picture of the bones surrounding the brain, such as the skull, and even facial bones, the nose, sinuses. Newer technologies, such as a CT scan or MRI, give a much more detailed image of the brain. Therefore, x-rays of the skull are really not used as often as they were in the past to look at the brain because you can't really see the brain tissue itself. You may be able to see a fracture of the skull that actually goes deep into the brain, but you won't actually see the brain tissue. You'll just see the displacement of the bone. The second way to look at the brain is through computerized tomography or CT scan. This mechanism uses computer processed x-rays to produce tomographic images. So really what a CT scan is, is multiple x-rays that are taken at different angles through the brain. And then a computer puts those angles together to come up with an image. A CT image can detect problems such as a tumor bleeding into the brain tissue, as well as brain swelling that can occur after traumatic brain injury. Sometimes a dye has to be injected into the vein to better visualize structures, especially when you're looking at the blood vessels within the brain. On the right-hand side of this slide is a CT scan showing bleeding into the brain tissue. The bleeding is represented by this white patch within the brain tissue. The third way by which science can actually look at the brain is through magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. Instead of x-rays, the MRI uses high-level magnetic fields and radio waves to image the brain. MRIs are extremely useful in identifying tumors, blood clots in the brain, infections, any structural damage, active bleeding, or even swelling within the brain. You can see by this picture that shows an MRI scan 
of a brain tumor and a CT scan of the brain tumor, the MRI scan in this case gives a much better picture of the brain tissue as well as the tumor. This fourth way by which one could look at the brain is through functional magnetic resonance imaging or an fMRI. This is not done at all medical institutions. It's done on a research basis on many institutions and it's just one of those newer tests that eventually may become part of a standard screening tool for individuals that do have brain injury. This type of study monitors changes in brain activity by measuring the changes in blood flow and oxygen uptake. Really allows for the study of different functions of parts of the brain. I'd like to give you an example of how it can tell the functional aspects of the brain. If you are reading, you are actually using your visual cortex because that information needs to go back to your visual cortex. Well, a functional MRI during a time of reading should actually pick up extra blood flow in the occipital or the back part of the brain during the reading activity. So that's one way by which the functional aspect of the brain could be looked at. This could be done with any type of sensory input into the brain and then look at whether or not you see an increase in blood flow that you'd expect to see. Another way by which science can look at the brain is through PET scanning or positron emission tomography. This shows brain activity instead of structure. It's a little bit similar to the functional MRI in that it looks at functioning of the brain. The scan actually detects radioactive glucose that's injected into the patient. The parts of the brain that are the most active will take up the glucose. And that tells you which parts of the brain are active during certain activities. Again, I gave the example for a functional MRI. If one was reading, you'd expect to have increased blood flow to the back portion of the brain or the occipital lobe. The same thing would be true for PET scanning. You would see an increase in glucose uptake in the back of the head or in the occipital area. Again, this is a scan that's not available at every facility. It's becoming much more prevalent at major research hospitals. Many scientists feel that the PET scanning and functional MRI are ways by which we could find out a lot of information when it comes to concussions where there is no structural damage, it's just a functional impairment of the brain. Another way to look at the brain is the electroencephalogram. This picture shows an individual undergoing an EEG or an electroencephalogram, which really measures the electrical activity within the brain. It's one of the earliest brain scanning technologies. The nerve impulses in the brain take the form of little tiny currents. The electrodes on the scalp can actually detect those currents. And therefore, the brain function can be determined based on those electrical currents. EEGs help to diagnose sleep disorders as well as seizures. The magnetoencephalograph, or the MEG, is another tool that's used primarily on a research basis. Again, not every medical institution has this type of machine. However, it does identify brain activity and measures magnetic fields that are produced in the brain. The magnetic fields are detected by sensitive devices that are called superconducting detectors and amplifiers. These are referred to as squids. It's used to detect abnormal activity that's associated with seizures. Now seizures can be one of the manifestations of a concussion or other types of traumatic brain injury. Seizures can manifest in a variety of different ways. There's the grand mal seizures where people shake violently, and then there are other seizures where people just stare forward but are not interacting with the environment. 
and this machine can actually detect where in the brain these seizures are originating from. The last way by which scientists can look at the brain is through behavioral studies. Scientists study the functions of parts of the brain by observing the behavior of people who have suffered brain damage or have degenerative brain diseases. Scientists can also use animal studies to investigate brain function. Certain animals can have parts of the brain destroyed and then behavior can be monitored. In human medicine, one of the hallmark studies that had to do with behavior and brain injury was the study of Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was an individual that worked on the railroad and experienced personality and behavioral changes after he had damage to his frontal lobe. This picture depicts Phineas Gage and the spike that actually went through his skull while he was working. Instead of describing the manifestations he had, I'd like to just show the film clip that depicts the story of Phineas Gage. This is the end of the module on the eight ways by which science looks at the brain. I wanna make a point that there are other ways which science looks at the brain, and I only highlighted eight of the more common ones that are used both clinically in traumatic brain injury as well as those that are used more on a research basis to study the brain. Thank you.